right, we're, we're already rolling, man. I'm Scott Hill with Flight Club. Now we're waiting on you. Yep, Steve Netherton. The Steve Netherton. Please, please forgive me if I call you Steven, but that's a story for another day. Okay. All right, so we are here to review and talk about Henry McKenna. Uh, we've got several different bottles to try uh, with some notes um, and some observations from us. Before we do that, let's do two quick things. One, uh, I'll talk real quick about why we're here on Hangouts, and then I'll, I'll give it to Steve, and he can talk a little bit about why we decided to do a Hangout as it relates to Henry McKenna. Uh, so we have, a, we have a blog, flightclubict.com. Um, chances are, if you're, if you're watching this video, you're probably on our blog looking at our post on Henry McKenna. Um, so we're, we're primarily bloggers. We do reviews. I do my own reviews. Steven does his own reviews. Sometimes we get together and do reviews. Um, uh, when we're together and do reviews, we you know, can compare notes. We can argue about some things, and we can finally reach a consensus. Well, a couple times we've tried to do uh, a review of the same bottle separately. We'll all do a review, take some notes, give him the bottle. He does a review. Uh, most of the time, our notes are pretty close to one another, but there's times where we're just way off from one another. Uh, so we're going to try to do this now on Hangouts when we've got uh, the same bottle we want to review. That way we can kind of hash out our differences uh, here. So we thought this would be a, a, a good one to start with. So, But I'll turn it over to you and tell you, and, and Steve can, can talk about why we're doing Henry McKenna. Well, we're doing Henry McKenna, I think. You could say we're doing it for the mothers because this is Mother's Day weekend. And Henry McKenna, thanks to the San Francisco World Spirits Competition, is now the mother of all bourbon. So Henry McKenna, their bottled and bond, 10-year-old single barrel bourbon, which has been uh, just known as a dependable mid-shelf in the $30 to $35 range generally. Bourbon was named best overall bourbon. Not best bottled and bond, not best single barrel, the best bourbon overall. And Fred Minnick, who uh, fancies himself as a, as a connoisseur of many things, and rightly so, sort of spilled the beans before the official announcement by uh, declaring that this one was the winner. He was a judge at the competition. And I'm going to read an excerpt of what he wrote describing the uh, sample. And this is his description uh, from his blog when he was writing about the competition and I think what he's writing here and I want to about to read is when he was sampling them blind. So all the judges, when they're judging all these bourbon entries are doing so blind. Here's how he described it. He said, beautiful and complex at a hundred proof. It packed more flavor than anything he had tasted at that point. In the competition layered with toffee, caramel, almond butter, honey, and fried pie crust. And it offered something special. So obviously the judges and Fred Minnick knew some of the specifications of this bottle when they were judging it. Obviously not knowing the brand, not knowing the label. But how highly he spoke of it and how it ended up being, if you read his blog post, kind of the runaway winner, was intriguing when you consider that this was something that was on the shelf um, in years past and is on the shelf presently at a very affordable price. It's not a limited release offering, and yet it won Best Overall Winner. And so we're going to review several different samples uh, of this because it's a single barrel product. There can be variation from bottle to bottle. So, Scott, if you want to go ahead and read out what the specifications are for the four different samples that we're going to try. Well, one thing also to keep in mind is uh, Fred Minnick indicated that uh, the bottle that they ended up using was directly off a shelf. Um, there's rumors floating around whether that was in Kentucky and that was shipped in or whether it was a, you know, a local distributor or uh, um, a shop of some sort, but uh, uh, it came right off the shelf. So, you know, the, the whole theory that uh, Heaven Hill sent in a honey barrel um, supposedly isn't accurate. And so what we're going to do is check these out and see if there's, uh, honey barrel amongst the ones that we have or whether they're pretty consistent products. So I have even a, more than, even more than that. He made it, he made it sound like it was an afterthought. He, he made it sound as if 
someone from Heaven Hill, the producer, the distiller, ran out and grabbed one off the shelf in San Francisco and then brought it in. Uh, he was he spoke of it in that sort of tone. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it, maybe that happens. I don't know. Uh, maybe they grabbed the right bottle. Maybe that honey barrel was placed in that market for a reason. We may never know. Uh, so our first barrel, uh, these are all pretty recent bottles, but our first barrel is uh, barreled on uh, 8-16-2005. This is the oldest bottle that we have. Interestingly, this has the old screw top to it. Uh, I will say that this is the one bottle of any of them that has been open for a while. Uh, it's taken a little hit recently when uh, sharing some samples here with Steve, but uh, that's going to be maybe maybe there's a little bit of error that's affected that one uh, more so than the others, but we'll we'll find out. Uh, so the next bottle we have is October 22nd of 2007. This has been a bottle that I picked up here recently uh, in the last month off the shelf. Uh, the third one is, Steve, that's your bottle. So what's the details on it? Yeah, so this one was barreled on uh, December 14, 2007. Um, and I picked this one up not too long ago. It was after the Fred Minnick blog post. And we won't comment on the hit that that bottle has taken in a short period of time. I've given lots of samples out for that one. <laughs> uh, the last one that we have is December 20th, 2007. Uh, so this, that, one's, uh, that one's fresh off the shelf maybe last week. And that's a fresh crack uh, when I poured a uh, Steve sample bottle. So uh, that hasn't had any time to, to uh, air out. Before we get going on uh, sample number one here, do you notice – any color difference whatsoever in your four samples? I, I, I don't really notice much color difference. The, the uh, December 2007 may have a little bit more co color. I did notice when I was pouring out of the bottles for the October 22nd, 2007, it poured differently, like it was a lot thicker than the others. So I'll see if that, if that pans out. Okay, because oddly enough, the one that I have here too from December 20th, 2007, our fourth sample is a little bit darker than the others, but being that this is a bonded product and that they're all 10 years old and for bonded bourbons, if they're all 10 years old, they really are going to be all 10 years old. It won't just be that they are at least 10 years old. Uh, they are all 10 years old. There really shouldn't be any difference, but I was a little bit surprised that the different uh, color, the darker color of that last sample. But keep in mind, they're single barrels. So one barrel could be could be a 13-year-old barrel so long as it was distilled in one season. Uh, and the others could all be 10. So it is possible. And unlike bottles uh, such as Four Roses single barrel, Henry McKenna does give a barrel number, a four-digit number. But I've not seen anything that indicates how that you can tell where that barrel was located in a warehouse or even what warehouse it was. And so we truly don't know whether any of these uh, were located in different portions of the warehouse, shared the same warehouse uh, or either. And I don't know, uh, you know, my 2015 bottle has a, a number, uh, excuse me, 2005 that I probably picked up in 2015 or 16 has a barrel number of 2,600. Surely that's not a barrel number starting at beginning, like think of Knob Creek, how they not, how they label their single barrels. They just started at one and they're at, you know, 5,000, 6,000 now. Um, all these appear to go in numerical order. So it's possible that we're only, you know, into 5,000 barrels all time of Henry McKenna, uh, which uh, considering it's been, uh, mid-90s, I think, was when Henry McKenna started. Uh, that's not very many barrels. What uh, barrel number do you have for your December 20th, 2007 bottle? Uh, 4368. Yeah, so my uh, December 1407 bottle is barrel number 4320. That's so that's, it is interesting to see that numerical difference given that these were uh, barreled um, – six days apart. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, with the recent bourbon boom, it's, it probably is selling a lot more than it did in the mid nineties, but that, that number would still be surprising if we're only at 4,500 barrels since the nineties. Right. 
right. All right. All right. So we're number one here. All right. Number one. It's, it's incredibly sweet right up front. I mean, that, that sweet caramel candy is what jumps out immediately. There's a little bit of underlying fruit, a little bit of cherry maybe, but not much. Mm -hmm. A lot of spice. Off screen, my wife has just joined us and uh, is not holding back the snickering at all which is why i've got the headphones hooked up so that that doesn't come through very clearly i locked i locked the door so my family couldn't come laugh at me so that was a good idea there's a little bit of uh of spice and it's not like a rye pepper spice because i don't really get any rye to this at all i don't think there's really much rye in this uh but more of like a a, a sharp oak spiciness yeah and i get a good oak char scent to nothing you know, nothing you know wrong that, with that scent that comes off like when you when you're scraping the grates on your grill a little bit yeah a little pe like peanut shell not peanuts so much it's maybe like i even thinking like almost salty peanut shell kind of thing mm-hmm I get that peanut shell and that charred oak first on this one. And this is, so it, it's the same recipe, the same mash bill, same yeast strain as far as we know as Elijah Craig and Evan Williams, um, which is interesting because uh, that that's what's been quoted by uh, Heaven Hills. It's, they say it's the same recipe. So does that mean just mash bill? Does that mean mash bill and yeast strain? I guess we don't know. Uh, but saying it's the same recipe to me means it's both. Uh, they, they share both of those qualities. Um, Elijah Craig, to me, has always been a little bit more fruity from Heaven Hill um, uh, than the Evan R Williams, which I have always thought is a little bit more nutty characteristic. This um, is an interesting marriage between those two. Uh, and maybe it's because it's, it's older, uh, but it's got a little bit of both of those qualities to it. I would say for me, this falls closer to the Evan Williams. The Elijah yeah. Craig for me has so much more fruitiness to it. The old 12 year had a lot more oak to it and fruit, dark fruit, even the new non-age stated hasn't drastically changed, but it's more of a fruit forward profile. This seems to be more of the oak and uh, soft caramel forward. Um, just, you know, the Evan Williams is certainly a, a, a cheaper product uh, a little bit thinner throughout and doesn't have nearly the richness and balance that this has, but it's always come a little closer to that for me. Yeah. If you put a spectrum of Elijah Craig on one end and Evan Williams on the other, this certainly does fall closer to the Evan Williams, the nutty characteristic of it more. It is that the peanut covered in the caramel and then with some, some dark chocolate in there. Um, it's the roasted peanut too. Uh, it's a nice combination. I mean, it's pleasant. But what's interesting, and I don't know if you want to quite get to this yet, is um, the finish is a little bit abrupt. It's really not that long. I, yeah, I, I agree. And it, it, the um, grill grate flavor that you talked about earlier is something I definitely pick up on the finish, and that's what I'm left with. I wouldn't say it's bitter at all, but it's um, it's a little bit dry on the finish. Yeah, uh, it's a little bit toffee and, and that char peanut shell again, roasted peanut. Uh, not a lot of fruit there uh, anywhere other than the nose. Would you say it's beautiful and complex? Not words that I would necessarily use. This is one of those that I think, you know, has really solid traditional bourbon flavors, um, but doesn't, in my mind, seem to offer anything exceptional to it but, but solid it doesn't undersell its age statement you know it, i i don't i don't taste this and think there's no way this is 10 years old um i think the the proof interestingly um gosh you, you imagine if this was anything under the 100 proof 
it, it seems like it would it would really fall off a little bit. Um, it's not uh, real punchy uh, with its flavors. Um, it's not overly rich. You know, some bourbons that are 100 proof really come at you. Four Roses being one, um, where it's 100 proof and it punches a little bit above its weight. I don't feel like this really does. Yeah, I think it would get a little bit thin, certainly under 100 proof. Um, and I'd be curious of what that peanuttiness would do, either higher proof or lower proof, and how much punchier that, that, that nut flavor would get on this. So here's a, here's a question for you. So far on number one, um, and the comparison is a little bit unfair because uh, it wasn't meant to be this way, but there is an Evan Williams white label uh, bottled in bond. It's, so it's also 100 proof. It's, a, it's four years old at least. Um, being bottled in bond, um, that is going to be more in the twenty dollar range. Um, where or how far off do you think this is from that? Does this say to you that it's definitely at least twice as old um, and seems to have a, a higher quality, and that's why maybe it was shifted into the Henry McKenna brand, or would you say they're really not that far apart? Uh, well, first I. Um I think you're a little high on your price and that's one of the, the beauties of the, of the white label is I think you're even around here, you can find it for 15. I've heard as low as 12. Um, you know, I mean, it's a great value. Um, you know, if we talk about this one, not having a whole lot of complexity, uh, complexity to its flavors, then white label has no complexity to its flavors. It's, it's for me, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, you know, kind of your, um, brown sugar caramel and nuttiness and it's pretty simplistic um it's pretty tasty but it's it's not refined at all it's not balanced um it's not complex i this to me um it feels older um a more well-rounded uh more of a, a balanced product that it, it doesn't surprise me at all that this is a you know a bottle that's twice as expensive it seems to have a lot more layers than the Evan Williams does. I think that Evan Williams, yeah, is is so strong on on the nutty characteristics um, that it's hard to get much more out of it than that. You get a little bit maybe if you add that that caramel and dark chocolate, but not much more. This does seem to offer something extra, um, but like you said, with as cheap as you can find that. Is it twice as good? Is it one of those things where uh, the price is reflective of uh, the comparative quality? I'm not sure. Well, that's a struggle for me with Henry McKenna anyway, because Elijah Craig I can usually find for uh, four or five bucks cheaper uh, than I find this. I know it's a little bit lower in proof, uh, but for me, if I'm staying in the Heaven Hill family, um, I'm, I'm probably going with Elijah Craig. I, I do think it's a better value. Uh, for a you know what may be probably a eight nine ten eleven year product now no, no longer a twelve year, um, but I think it's a little bit better value. So I, I'm you know you, you and I have talked about this before. I, I've never I've not been the the greatest Henry McKenna fan. Not that it's bad by any means. It's just that there's even in the Heaven Hill family you talk about the Evan Williams White Label. Uh, I'll talk about uh, Elijah Craig all day, but you know those seem to be a whole lot better value at least in my mind. But I know there's a lot of people out there who disagree and think Henry McKenna is the greatest value in bourbon. Well, Heaven Hill deserves to be saluted for so many of their products that they deliberately price uh, at a point that is going for affordability. Uh, right. And so that should be appreciated. This is one where, and this happens sometimes with a pour that you'll find is you'll nose it. You'll drink it, and then when you come back to it after those first few sips and nose it again, something has changed, and this now has become much more fruity than it was initially. I, I definitely agree with that as it's been sitting here. I've, I've uh, nosed the second one a time or two now and come back to this first one, and there's definitely more there. Uh, I definitely get more fruit. Uh, red licorice is kind of what comes to my mind, but I, I get maybe a little bit of like apricot or peach and maybe a little bit of apple there too. Yeah. And I think I'm maybe even picking up a little bit of, of maybe plum and uh, underripe blackberry. 
Um, and these are things that I'm not really picking up too much on the palate. It's still just in the nose, but um, it's nice to see this open up in that way. All right, anything else on uh, one before we move on to number two? No, and I'm leaving plenty in one to, to come back if we need to. I'll go ahead and, well, first of all, this uh, palate cleansing break is brought to you by Kroger Seltzer Water. So. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm nosing number two already, and I'm getting uh, a lot more toffee flavors to this. Um, the the peanuttiness has, has toned down a little bit. Oh, yeah, definitely. This has much more of like the, it's leaning towards like the candy bar that's got the nuts in it, but it's not like the bag of circus peanuts that the first one was. I get a little bit of... Um, pepper spice and you know I commented on the first one that I, I take it more being from the oak uh, than anything else but a little bit of uh, not fresh ground black pepper but you know kind of the pre-ground just very very light um, a little bit of sawdust in there too mm -hmm. not as much fruit um, on this one compared to the first one especially after that first one aired out a bit um, Although I do get a little bit of maybe some raisin on this one, some a little bit of kind of dried fruit. Yes, this does have like, yeah, the raisin date and kind of fruitiness. Interestingly that, you know, you're picking up on that spice, but sometimes the bourbon when it, uh, you try it initially on the palate can also almost have like a cooling effect. Uh, and, you know, these are all not uh, anything other than room temperature, obviously, but this one has that initial cooling effect, which is interesting with, a, which I think also um, is imparted by this has a much oily, more oily mouthfeel than the first one. Yeah, I definitely agree. I don't know if there's a, maybe a mintiness to this. Um, mm. I'm getting a whole lot kind of like that, effervescent uh, mouthwash or, or uh, toothpaste kind of, you, you said kind of light, I mean, Altoid kind of um, cools your mouth uh, essence to this. Still not getting a lot of nuttiness on this one. No, this is, I'll say this is, I think, markedly different than the first one um you know both in the notes we're picking up but also just the mouthfeel of it um i can see how people might prefer one over the other even it's that different it's got a longer finish probably helped by the more coating mouthfeel on this one um again not terribly long but it does stick uh, a little bit longer a little bit of chocolate maybe uh kind of dry cocoa kind of chocolate not quite yeah. cocoa maybe even some like chocolate covered cherries uh there's a little bit of fruit there in the finish yeah the fruit decrescendos um uh, throughout uh but it does remain for sure maybe a little apple flavor on this one Definitely a great mouthfeel on it. Mm -hmm. I think they're different from one another so far. One, I talked more about the uh, traditional bourbon flavors. I get that more out of number one. Number number two seems to have some different things going on to it. I don't know that I would necessarily peg uh, number two for Henry McKenna right off the bat. Yeah, maybe not. Um it's interesting uh, how this one has much more of that on the, the fruit on the nose and then almost like the French silk chocolate kind of when you combine the, the texture of it and then uh, some of the flavors on the palate. Um, I get more vanilla out of this one too than I did the first one. So, you know, when we talked about the, the Elijah Craig, Evan Williams spectrum, on the first one, how it was closer to the Evan Williams for its nutty characteristics. 
this doesn't seem to really fall on that spectrum very much. I mean, the nose has more of the fruity characteristics, but it's it's not something that you would definitely um, go ahead and group with an Elijah Craig or, or an Evan Williams. Um, this is nice. I, I like this one. Yeah, I'm picking up on a little like like suede leather kind of nose on it. Yeah, it's a little and, bit different than I'm not used to. I, I I enjoy it. And while I'm going back, there's a little bit of almost like that nougat uh, where you get a little bit of those sweet flavors and that combined nutty chocolate, um, a little bit of that you know that hint of something herbal. That's uh, a good. This is a very well balanced, well rounded. Um, it's inoffensive. It doesn't have anything harsh that jumps out either. It drinks a little bit under proof, but it's but it's still full flavored. Um, but it still doesn't knock your socks off. You know, it's not something that you would say, "Wow, this is a premium kind of offering." Uh, but it's just solid. You know, I think that for this kind of bottle, if you're paying the the thirty two, uh, give or take a couple of dollars retail price on it. You're feeling good about that uh, when you take this back. When you take this back home, I agree. Uh, although I don't think I'm out there trying to find another uh, 39.91 barrel uh, because it's so exceptional at 32 dollars. I think, hey, let's let's try the next barrel and see what it has to offer. Just nothing that remarkable to me. Right. Yeah. I, it, it's certainly not that way. I, trying to think of the kind of cocktail that this would be best for too. Um, and I don't know. I mean, it, you can go a bunch of different ways. Uh, I mean, cause it seems like it could be somewhat versatile. Uh, yeah, that was a good one. All right. Uh, number three, we ready to move on. Yeah. I get more of that uh, kind of peppery oak flavor in this. And some dark chocolate maybe on the nose. Yeah, this has more of the like the the peppercorn kind of peppery flavor yeah. than the the pre ground really fine kind of peppery you might get on a on a restaurant table. And, and part of why we're doing this on, on hangouts is sometimes it's hard to convey in writing what we're talking about on pepper, the difference between fresh ground pepper and solid peppercorns. I, I like fresh ground pepper from peppercorns. I don't like pre-ground black pepper. It's a completely different flavor to me. This is, this is a pleasing pepperiness to it. There's kind of some fresh oak, uh, kind of fresh sawn oak in there. This isn't this isn't giving me any of that old oak that I associate with Elijah Craig. Um, kind of that old damp dank oak. Uh, this is all more like fresh, solid, fresh cut oak. It uh, yeah, that some people would describe it as more like the green oak flavor or scent. Um, yeah, it does seem to have that. And, and for me, that's uh, a thin line before it gets to kind of a cardboardiness with the oak, and that's what I get a lot of times out of the Evan Williams. Um, this gets just beyond that, but it doesn't quite have the, the richness to the oak that, that I'd like to see that's more of the um, Elijah Craig flavors. It's not bad, but it's just it's not – it's not that old oak kind of flavor. It smells younger. Yeah. I get some like overripe peach, overripe fruit of some sort. There's a little bit of ethanol on the nose on this one, a little bit of tingle. There's also a little bit of kind of cloying sweetness. Vanilla. Yeah, with that really highly processed white sugar sweetness. 
Yeah, I was thinking kind of like Demerara that it's just, you know, barely a step off of that. Yeah, the, I get a, the, the nose smells, the, the kind of the sweetness feels a little bit watered down on this one compared to some of the others. It's good. It's I like it, especially that, that pepper with the kind of balance as well with some of that sweetness, but a little bit, a little bit diluted. That vanilla sugar pepperiness. Yeah, it has that stinging, sugary feeling. Yeah, I, I can see that that kind of white sugar flavor on this one. Uh, that's that is pretty sharp. That blackberry flavor you described earlier, I kind of get that in this as well. Do you get any nuttiness really on that palate? No, no, <laughs> no. Which for me, that's unfortunate because I really like the Heaven Hill nuttiness that I get. This just seems to be lacking in that. At best on the palate, this could be described as bright, like how you would describe really citrusy, sweet flavors as bright. But a more uh, negative way to describe this, but maybe still just as accurate would be that sharp stinging um, where you don't say it's a bite that you get from a, a spice, like a rice spice, um, or even necessarily from the ethanol because uh, it's so closely tied to that sweet flavor. Um, uh, I, I don't know. This is, it's just not as inviting. This, if to make a pair, it's kind of Smarties candy, um, it's a, mm -hmm. a simple sugar. It's not quite pixie stick. It's not quite that sharp, but it's close. Though. Subtle, yeah, subtle fruitiness kind of flavor behind that sugar, but it's just kind of hard, kind of hard candy sugar. And it's very drying on the back end of the finish. I mean, just like if you were to have one of those candies, and then you realize I need some water right now. It, it's very drying. Not a lot of change between the palate and the finish. Just no. kind of carries through for a while until kind of that dryness picks in. It, it, this one's easy to drink. Um, I, I I don't know that I enjoy it as much as the as the last one that we just had. Um, but there's some good flavors in it. So what I ended up finding with this particular bottle is I didn't enjoy it neat as much and then if I added ice I mean I just lost too much what I liked doing with this was using a little bit less sugar or simple syrup than I otherwise would and then going a little bit heavier into the fruit you know like with the orange and an old-fashioned and that ended up complementing some of these flavors and notes better and one thing about bonded uh, bourbon particularly is it does lend itself to good cocktails um, and this I thought was great for that, but then when you strip it all away and then you taste it neat again, I don't know it so far out of the three that we've tried, it's my least favorite sample. But good point on the cocktail on this. There, there's nothing that would be offensive in a cocktail. There's nothing that's going to stand out in uh, ruin your cocktail. It's just going to be solid, uh, through and through and, and kind of probably balance pretty well with whatever you put into it. But I agree, if you lighten up the sugar on this, it's got enough sweetness that, that probably works well. All right, number four. Yeah, the one that was barreled just six days later. Back to some of that toffee, kind of brown sugar sweetness on this one. Yeah, it's much more like the first two than the third. Um, get that this has a little bit more of the, the sweet and salty nuttiness.
this one has some pretty nice oak flavors to the to the nose or oak smells to the nose. Yeah, almost. I mean, you get some of that where you would maybe uh, think it was more like cedar uh, or like you said, sawdust earlier. But there is yeah. some of that wood there that's nice. And it doesn't have the, the green, young kind of scent that the, the last one did. It's a very faint butterscotch. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a little bit more butterscotch to me than caramel. Yeah. I, I, I like the nose on this one. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit thicker mouthfeel, not quite oily. It is thicker. I mean, you can almost chew on this. The chewing is continues all the way through the finish. Yeah. Yeah, very much like a, a lot of candy bar flavors, maybe some peanuts in there, some chocolate. Yeah, I just bit into a Snickers bar. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's pretty tasty. Yeah, this one is. This one is solid. The finish is maybe the longest of the four. There's some slight bitterness at the beginning of the palate, but that kind of fades away. To like that what kind you of get in like a really high cocoa content dark chocolate you know where it's like 70 80 percent um yeah yeah definitely uh, it's not not a kind of tannic dryness um but it but it rounds out nicely some of those vanilla flavors this caramel sweetness nougat it's whatever just, you guys yeah it's just sweet enough to make sure that it it doesn't go too far towards the bitterness to be off-putting. There's a line of vanilla that really carries through from start to finish on this uh, mm -hmm. that I haven't quite experienced in the others. That's, that's pretty good. I get a little bit of that blackberry with this. I'm trying to pick up on other fruits, but Not much. I keep coming back to apple, maybe a little bit apple skin, red apple skin on this. Yeah. A little bit, you know, I think kind of dry, um, kind of that waxy skin. That's a little bit what I'm getting on this one. Some There's some underlying pepperiness to this one as well. Um, yeah, it, and it, it stays, uh, maybe not muted, but just below the surface enough that it doesn't take away from some of these other flavors that we've been talking about or doesn't shroud them. Um, but it reminds you that, yeah, this, this is a hundred proof, you know, it's, and I think it, it almost helps deliver some of those, uh, those scents and flavors a little bit uh, more powerfully because it's there, uh, but doesn't distract from them. On the nose, you know, we're talking about pepper and kind of fruit. I get kind of like some red pepper, fresh red pepper kind of spice to the nose. Yeah, like the, um, if you've got like the red pepper flakes that are, you know, undisturbed, and if you really just tried to to smell them by themselves, that, that it looked more so than the other three for sure. Well, I'd be hard pressed to put these in any order. Um, other than the third one being in the last. Other than the third one being in last. I, I probably agree with that. Uh, two and four seem to be kind of some front runners for me. Um, but they're, they're just, 
ever so slightly edging out the, the first one that we tried. And, and even those two aren't like incredible standouts that these are amazing single barrels. But if I had all four of them in front of me and I wanted to taste them, I'd probably say, well, you know, if you want to pour me a full glass, pour me a full glass of two or four versus one. Go back to number one and smell how much more of the vanilla that you get than you didn't get before. Oh, absolutely. Isn't that amazing? I mean, to the point where it's like the, like a vanilla sponge cake kind of smell. There's a little bit of a lemon, like vanilla lemon cake. There's some baking spice in there too, that I'm not quite placing. I mean, that's just a, a completely different nose than it yeah. was the first time around. Mm -hmm. All right. So we've, we've sampled four different bottles. Uh, do any of these stand out to you as front runners for whiskey of the year? No. Um, I don't have the benefit of judging them blind against other entrants and doing them in one sitting. Um, but none of these have reached out and grabbed me in a way that um, your William Leroux Weller, or George T. Stagg, or Midwinter Night's Dram uh, would, uh, or some of your um, sherry finish cast strength scotches would uh, these still seem like at best they are the solid dependable value bourbons that when you want to go and get something where you know what you're going to get it's not going to disappoint you that's why henry mckenna is there uh three out of four of these definitely do that for me but they do not reach up into that upper echelon of it's going to stay with me later on and it'll come back to mind. Oh man, I remember when I tried that bottle. It just doesn't take me there. Yeah, sometimes you try to get in the head of the judges and you wonder if this is a year where simple was better. Um, you know, getting back to those kind of the heart of those core bourbon flavors is what they're looking for. You know, but last year, what was their pick? Barrel Batch 11. And you and I both tried that, and I enjoyed it. I don't think you quite enjoyed it quite as much, but we both agreed it was unique, and it was really something different that probably would have stood out among some, you know, very um, traditional bourbon flavors as, as kind of a standout. So, you know, that wins one year, and then this year, something with very traditional – you know, easy to, uh, easy to understand bourbon notes kind of wins out. So I don't know that you can, from year to year, you can say, I know what the judges are thinking. Now, and something that is more like barrel batch 11, where it is more unique, it's going to stand out because it's, it's a change of pace and maybe that can end up being refreshing when you feel like it's just the same old thing, sample after sample something that gives you some that a really new and interesting twist can be intriguing. Uh, this, I agree with what you said, it seems to be the, maybe if the simpler is better, if it's almost the inverse If everything else is more airing on the side of uniqueness and uh, overhandedness on uh, a particular attribute. But this is something that is easy to drink is going to hit more of that classic, kind of bourbon profile like we've said is very inoffensive um then maybe that's why it progressed the way it did or uh the one bottle that uh whoever from heaven hill came and grabbed off the shelf in san francisco happened to grab the best iteration of henry mckenna bottled and bond that the world has ever seen um and maybe we'll never see again. And that won the day. Who knows? I think 
the takeaway is Henry McKenna will probably not disappoint as long as you have the expectation of it being properly priced the way it is as long as it's close to retail but if you go into it thinking that I'm expecting the bourbon of the year uh, and comparing it to some other of the limited edition special releases that have uh, come out of Buffalo Trace or even Heaven Hill uh, I don't know. You might have to end up doing some mental gymnastics to end up reaching that conclusion. Well, I think that's fair enough. And I think that's a, a good uh, takeaway parting thought. Uh, so let's leave it at that. Uh, make sure you read our full review at flightclubict.com. And I, I think that's it. All right. Signing off here. All right. Sounds good. <laughs>